As you know, I've been doing a series over the seven churches of Revelation. And if you're not familiar with the the churches of Revelation, it is actually a prophecy. Um, It's actually the, the historical record of the Christian church all the way from the disciples until today, until the Lord comes back. And so it is it is my uh, objective that once the series is over that you can go back and watch them all back to back and you can clearly see the whole history of what happened and what's happening today. Um, the last sermon, the, the first sermon I did was on May the 8th, just for record for if you want to go back and find them on YouTube. It was on May the 8th on the Mount Pleasant Seventh-day Adventist um, YouTube channel, and it was over John on Patmos. And then the second um, sermon that I done was on July the 2nd of 2022 for future references. And that was over the Church of um, Ephesus. And we're, we're going to quickly do a recap of that church because it is very important that we understand that the message that was in that for that church was super important that they, they, they actually took his advice and did what he said because that is what was going to get them through this next era, which was the Church of Smyrna. And, um, yeah, let's go ahead and get it going. So I always try to reintroduce um, the basics of what we're going through. So if you if this is the first time you watch the sermon or watch the series, you know what's going on. Each, church, each one of the churches was an actual church existing in an actual city around 95 A.D. Um, so we're going to look at the map here in a few soon, but these are actual churches that John wrote to in his time. But they were also prophecies about the church and the church periods as a prophecy going forward. So that, like when you read Revelation and start reading about these churches, there's a lot of things there, um, as you're going to see. And let's see here. We have the seven churches in Revelation refer to several literal churches. I said that they were located in Asia Minor. So if you don't know where that is, I'm going to show you here in just a second. But that was during the era of the Roman Empire. And although the actual churches ceased to strive in the centuries of Muslim control after the Romans, the archaeological remains of all the seven lo- uh, locations currently exist in present-day Turkey. So you can actually go visit the, 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 the locations of these churches. If you like, A lot of people take those journeys and go visit these churches, the, the, the remains of them. So as you can see, the part of the world that we're in is in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, even the island of Patmos is, 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 is located here. And if you want to know what countries we're talking about, we're talking about Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iraq, that part of the world, Israel, Jordan, you know, that part of the world. And the country that today that that, that's called is Turkey. So the seven churches are on the east coast. I mean, the the west coast of uh, Turkey. And you you can see all the names that are still there. So if you're just wanting to, to go home and look these places up, that's where it's located. All right, so the church of Ephesus was from the time period of 31 A.D., which is John's time when he was on Patmos, to 100 A.D. And the church of Smyrna is from 100 A.D. to 313 A.D., okay? And basically during this time period for Smyrna, it was a time of persecution, all right, that ended with the great persecution that's actually mentioned in that in the Bible verse, um, the ten days, which in in, in um, spiritual speaking, a day is a is, is equivalent to a year, and a year is equal, uh, equal to a day. So it was ten years of like like mass persecution, um, and so each one of these churches had a spiritual message. And as if you recall from the last sermon. The message for Ephesus was return to thy first love. And we went through all of the reasons. Um, if you want to know if you still had your first love and if you didn't, how could you regain it or whatever. Smyrna, the message was be faithful unto death because this was going to be one of the most terrible uh, time periods that the Christian church has, has ever gone through. So... Um, this was uh, Smyrna from 100 A.D. to 313 A.D. This was a time period when God's church went through a terrible persecution by the emperor Diocletian. Now, forgive me by pronouncing these Roman names. <laughs> uh, a lot of what you're going to learn like here today comes from Wikipedia. So I'm going to do 
the spiritual message, but I'm going to let the historians tell you so that, that if you're watching this uh, series and you're wondering if this is all true, this is coming where you can, you can go watch it. And I'm talking to the general audience on YouTube. This is Emperor Diocletian, and we're going to read about what all happened um, with this emperor. Smyrna means a sweet smell, such as a perfume. Jesus acknowledged the state of this church. These Christians were poor and in hiding because they were persecuted by the Romans. And Jesus encouraged them and reminds them that they will be rich when he, clean, when he comes with his reward. And 10 days in Bible prophecy equals 10 years. Um, for those of you watching, when you study prophecy and you study your Bible, um, when you're doing prophecies, you can use this, this, this rule that, that you can, that's biblical, that one year equates to, to, uh, to one day, or one day equals to one year. And that's what, what in that Bible verse, what we're going to be doing here. Um, here's something interesting about persecution. It weeds out false Christians. And if you remember from what the first church was going through, it was very important that that the false Christians were being weeded out. Um, but the true Christians, they stayed faithful to God, and their faithfulness was like a sweet perfume to him. And God had nothing bad to say about this church. So if you, when you read about the churches of Revelation, there were two churches he didn't have anything bad to say about, and this one was one of them. So if you read the other churches, he had good things to say about them, but he also had bad things to say about them. So with our church being the last one and the worst one. So, so quickly summarize Ephesus and the message. Ephesus is the first, and it was the church of John's time. Its time was from Jesus' resurrection to around the death of the last of the apostles. This early church was pure and eager to spread the truth about Jesus to the entire world. They watched carefully so that those who were false-hearted and meant to sneak in and do the church harm were sent away, and the true believers were carefully taught. The early apostolic church carried the gospel to all the then known world before the last of the apostles died. They suffered persecution and many died for their faith. Their eagerness to obey Jesus' command to teach all nations carried them to the ends of the earth. We see that already there was a problem in this church. Jesus said they had left their first love. By John's day there had come into the church those who wanted to rule and tell others what to do. Paul said the mystery of iniquity was already at work in his day. They started to look to men and not as much to Jesus and his word. And as they had been at first, Jesus warned them to go back to their first love or he would remove their candlestick and they would cease to be his people. The Nicolaitans were followers of, teach, of a teacher called Nicholas who began, among other things, to teach that the death of Christ on Calvary had done away with God's Ten Commandments law and it was now no longer necessary to keep the law of God. This doctrine is also taught in our day. Some claim that the gospel of Christ has made the law of God no, of no effect, that by believing we are released from the necessity of being doers of the word. This is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Christ so unsparely condemned. Some historians say that the teaching of this group has brought in the idea that the clergy or ministers were separate from the laity or people who should rule over them. Of course, that idea was as old as paganism because paganism always taught that that idea and, that idea and used it to oppress and rob the common people. Jesus says clearly, we are all brethren. No kingly power is to be found among his people. So, as you can see, he had, like, there were people in the church that were there to basically try to destroy from the inside. And then what happened in this next period was they got all weeded out because if you're not, if you're not really a true Christian, you're not going to stick around for all the hardships that comes with actually being a follower of Christ. So, I'm going to go ahead and read. We're going to start with Smyrna now, and it's found in Revelation 2, verse 8 through 11. And it says, And to the, church of the, uh, to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second devil. And this is basically what's going on. Satan wants to eradicate God's church. He has tried many different ways to do it, and he always resorted to persecution. The next church we go over is Pergamos, where you're going to see him change tactics because he realizes that does not work. Persecution actually does the opposite of stamping out his church. It actually makes it stronger and it grows when, he, when, it's, when God's church is persecuted. So you're going to see him change taxes in the next sermon. But in this one, uh, we're going to break down these verses here. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are in the synagogue of Satan. Revelation 2, verses 8 and 9. Smyrna means a sweet smell like a perfume. This was the time when God's people went through a terrible persecution by the emperor Diocletian. They would have tribulation 10 days. In prophecy, a day represents a literal year. This re- refers to the 10 years of persecution on the pagan Rome from um, 303 A.D. to 313 A.D. where thousands were slain. Their faithfulness as they stood for his truth was like a sweet perfume to God. Though some of the people in the first church had not gone back to their first love, most had. And now in this church, they stood bravely for the truth. This is the one church that Jesus had nothing say, bad to say about, say about. And then we go to verses, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou art to suffer, shall suffer. There, behold, the devil shall come to cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thy faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The ten days here mentioned are ten prophetic years. Persecution has a way of making the church very pure because selfishness, ease-loving people are afraid to join it, and those who do, who, who do are ready to die for it. There were many martyrs during those ten years, and, and if we were are faithful, we will meet them when Jesus comes and raises them to take them home with all his people. There were some in the beginning of the, of the, uh, the, beginning of the time of this church who were pretending to be Christians, but were not. And we're just there to harm the church because this, this, prof- this is a prophecy. Jews here mean Christian believers because after the death of Jesus, the real Jews were no longer God's special people. The 10 persecution, uh, persecution, the 10 day persecution, no doubt, got rid of many of the false ones as they would quickly leave. I, have you ever wondered why God probably is going to allow us to go through one more period of persecution? Do we have a lot of people who claim to be Christians? that you know they're not actually really Christians. It could be that this is the final weeding out, right? He wants to know who is going to be true, who, who, who are my real followers, who, are, who, is the, who is my real church. And that's why the, in these last days, that's going to be allowed to happen one more time because he wants to know who are the real followers. And the promise that he made was, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be heard of you in the second death, Revelations 2.11. The promise to this church was that if faithful, they would not be hurt by the second death. This means they would be raised to have eternal life. How kind Jesus was to point out to these dear people going through this terrible time that he had, that he had also been dead and rose again. So they, if faithful, would also. Okay. So, what I did, I found where they took the statues of the emperors, and artists reconstructed what they looked like based on on the statues. So I thought that would be a great way to um, allow you to see what the, these emperors what they not know what they look like, but close to what they would look like based on the sculptures. So if you're wondering what you're seeing, that's what that is. All right. Um, so what we're going to do, this is the part where you can find in Wikipedia. What I did is, because there's a lot of information there, I stripped it of all this information. I just want to get to the point. And, and, and there's a lot of information there that I'm not sharing. I'm just getting to the point of what, what actually happened. And if you want to go back and read it, just go, just search for Emperor Diocletian or the Great Persecution in Wikipedia and you'll find everything we're talking about here today. So, here are the main points. Um, in the early days, the first two centuries, that's from 100 AD through, you know, through the hundreds, through the 200s, 
um, of AD, the persecution really came from citizens. It did not come from official, like the emperors declaring a law or whatever. That's not where the persecution came from. It actually came from citizens, and we're going to read why. Um, and uh, an example of that is with, like Emperor Nero in 64 AD, there was a fire. I guess it was a great fire, and he did blame the Christians. Um, and so he persecuted the Christians over that, but he didn't make a law. So if, you, so if you're wondering about that persecution, he didn't actually like pass a law to persecute Christians. He just did it, right? But typically it was like the local government and it was the people that were persecuting the, church, the, the Christians in the early church. So from his first appearance to his legal, legalization under Constantine, which is going to be the next church we talk about, Christianity was an illegal religion in the eyes of the Roman state. For the first two centuries of existence, Christianity and its practitioners were unpopular with the people at large. Christians were always suspect, members of a secret society whose members communicated with a private code and who shied away from the public sphere. It was popular hostility, the anger of the crowd, which drove the earliest persecutions, not official actions. In Leon in 177 AD, it was only the intervention of civil authorities that stopped the pagan mob from dragging Christians from their houses and beating them to death. For the first two centuries of the Christian era, no emperor issued general laws against the faith or its church. These persecutions were carried out under the authority of, of local government officials. When Emperor Nero executed Christians for their alleged involvement in the fire of 64 AD, it was, for a, it was a purely local affair. It did not spread beyond the city limits of Rome. These early persecutions were certainly violent, but they were sporadic, brief, and limited in extent. They were a limited threat to Christianity as a whole. The very capriciousness of official action, however, made the threat of state cores and loom large in the Christian imagination. Um, are there things happening today with our own government where there's, there hasn't been anything official against Christian, like people who are trying to serve the Lord and the, the seventh day, like observing the Sabbath, but you're starting to see rumblings here and there where, you know, you can see where this is kind of going. Well, this is just a pattern. This is repeating basically. And that's what was happening here. It wasn't anything official, but you start to see the population, the civilians, the local government start to do these, these, these persecutions. So just pay, my, pay attention to that. Okay. Um, this, this emperor up here is Emperor Decius. This guy below is a Christian theologian called Origen. I guess that's how you pronounce his name. So I'm just, I'm just going to point these out as we go because there's a lot of historical names when we're talking about this stuff. In the third century, the pattern changed, though. All right. The emperors became more active and government officials began to actively pursue Christians rather than merely to respond to the will of the crowd. Christianity, too, changed. No longer were its practitioners merely the lower orders for meaning discontent. Some Christians were not rich or from the upper classes. Origen, this guy at the bottom here. Writing at about 248 A.D. tells of the multitude of people coming into the faith, even rich men and persons of positions of honor and ladies of high refinement and birth. Official reaction grew firmer. Emperor Maximin targeted Christian leaders. Emperor Decius, the guy you see here, demanding a show of support for the faith, proclaimed that all inhabitants of the empire must sacrifice to the gods, eat sacrificial meat, and testify to these acts. Christians were obstinate in their non-compliance. Church leaders like Fabian, Bishop of Rome, and Babylus, I'm, I guess I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Bishop of Antioch, were arrested, tried, and executed, as were certain members of the Christian laity, like Pinius of Smyrna. The Christian theologian Origen was tortured during the persecution and died about a year after um, the, from the resulting injuries. Let me see here. Okay, yeah. So this is Emperor Galenius, I guess how you pronounce his name. So we're going to talk about public support. Christian communities grew quickly in many parts of the empire and especially in the east after 260 AD when Emperor Galenius brought peace to the church. The data to calculate the figures are non-existent, but the historian and sociologist Keith Hopkins was given crude and tentative estimates for the Christian population for the third, in the third century. 
How can you estimate that the Christian community grew from a, from a population of about 1.1 million in 250 A.D. to a population of 6 million by 300 A.D., about 10% of the empire's total population? Like I said, when, when the church is being persecuted, what happens is it grows. That's what happens. And as we can see, Satan will change his tactics. Um, Christians were even expanding uh, into the countryside where they had never been numerous before. Churches in the later third century were no longer inconspicuous as they had been in the first and second. Large churches were prominent in certain major cities throughout the empire. The church in Nicomedia even sat on a hill overlooking the imperial palace. These new churches probably represented not only absolute growth in Christian population, but also the increasing influence of the Christian community. Within the highest ranks of the imperial administration, however, there were men who were ideologically uh, opposed to the toleration of Christians. Pagan priests, too, were interested in suppressing any threat to traditional um, religion because they felt threatened. So now we're about to start seeing a change. So this is Emperor... Diocletian. This is the man that in prophecy was going to um, issue um, the persecution. Now, the word is tetrarchic, uh, which means that's four. It's a four people rule. So the early, in the early Rome, you had a main emperor, and then they had three other like co-emperors, but they, were, but they served under the main emperor. And so... Um, that's what he's going to bring back to the Roman Empire when he gets in control here. Uh, he was a religious conservative, a Roman religious conservative, faithful to the traditional Roman cult and styled himself a restorer, which is part of why he brought back that ruling system. OK, so Christian communities uh, quick, grew quickly. In, uh, no, sorry. Diocletian acclaimed emperor was acclaimed emperor on November the 20th, 284 A.D. and was a religious conservative. Faithful to the traditional Roman cult, unlike Aurelian, Diocletian did not foster any new cult of his own. He preferred older gods, Olympian gods. Nonetheless, Diocletian did wish to inspire a general religious revival. Diocletian associated himself with the head of the Roman pantheon, Jupiter. His co-emperor, Maximian, associated himself with Hercules. This connection between God and emperor helped to legitimize the emperor's claims to power and tied imperial government closer to the traditional cult. Diocletian, like Emperor Augustus and Emperor Trajan, Trajan I think that was how you say his name, before him, styled himself a restorer. He urged the public to see his reign and his governing system, the tetrarchy, the tech I can't say the word, um, but yeah, tet, I tried to even listen to the pronunciation of it, tech archery. I guess how I said the rule of by four emperors as a renewal of traditional Roman values and a return to the golden age of Rome. As such, he reinforced the longstanding Roman preference for ancient customs and imperial opposition to independent societies, which is part of what we're about what was about to happen. So what you're seeing here, you see Emperor Diocletian. And the three uh, emperors that were serving underneath him was Emperor uh, Galerius, Emperor Constantius. And if that sounds familiar, it's because he was the father of Emperor Constantine. And then you have Emperor Maximian, which you just heard just a second ago. Those, that's, that was the ruling power. Okay. The great persecution was the last and most su uh, severe persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire. In 303 A.D., which was the beginning of that prophecy. The emperors Diocletian, Maximian, Galerius, and Constantius issued a series of edicts rescinding Christians' legal rights and demanding that they comply with the traditional religious practices. Later edicts tar targeted the clergy and demanded universal sacrifice, ordering all inhabitants to sacrifice to the gods. Christians had been subject to intermediate local discrimination in the empire, but emperors prior to Diocletian were reluctant to issue general laws against the religious group. And before I go any forward, doesn't that tactic sound very familiar? What happened with Daniel, if you remember? What did that, what did that ruler do? He, the, his advisors tricked him into passing a law that they knew that the Christians, like the Jews, would not follow. 
And then when they didn't follow him, they were, the plan was to, go get, to get Daniel, right? So as you can see, Satan is repeating his tactics. They're passing edicts that they know Christians will not follow. And it wasn't just the Christians. There were also other religious groups, but they were the one that they feared the most because they were growing and they were growing in power as well because of the people who were joining the church. All right, so Christians have been subject to intermediate local discrimination in the empire, but emperors prior to Diocletian were reluctant to issue general laws against the religious group. Diocletian's assumption to power in 240 AD did not mark an immediate reversal of imperial inattention to Christianity, but it did herald a gradual shift in official attitudes toward religious minorities. In the first 15 years of his rule, Diocletian purged the army of Christians. He condemned the Manichaeans to death and surrounded himself with public opponents of Christianity. Diocletian's preference for activist government combined with his self-image as a restorer of past Roman glory foreboded the most pervasive persecution in Roman history. And so, in the winter of 302 AD, Galerius urged Diocletian to begin a general persecution of the Christians. Diocletian was wary and asked the oracle of Apollo at Didyma for guidance. The oracle's reply was read as an endorsement of Galerius' position, and a general persecution was called on February 23rd, 303 A.D., just as prophecy had foretold. Persecutory policies varied in intensity across the empire. Whereas Galerius and Diocletian were avid persecutors, Constantius was unenthusiastic. Um, Later, uh, persecutory edicts, including calls for universal sacrifice, were not applied in his domain. His son, Constantine, on taking the imperial office in 306 AD, restored Christians to full legal equality and returned property that had been confiscated during the persecution. In Italy, in 306 AD, the Archbishop Maxentius, I can't say his name, casted Maximian's successor, Severus. Promising full religious toleration, Galerius ended the persecution in the, in the east in 311 AD, but it resumed in Egypt, Palestine, and Asia Minor by his successor, Maximinus. Constantine and Licinius, Licinius that's his name, Severus's successor, signed the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, which was also in, in the uh, prophecy, which offered a more comprehensive, uh, comprehensive acceptance of Christianity than Galerius, Galerius's edict had provided. Uh, Licinius ousted Maximinus, Ma- Ma- Maximinus in 313 AD, bringing an end to the persecution in the east. However, the persecutions failed to check the rise of the church because in persecution, the church will grow. Because people start to see people dying for their faith and it moves people in ways that nothing else can move them. And they begin to see that what they were teaching and what they were sharing about God's law was true. So true that people were willing to suffer for it and people start to join the church even more. And by 324 A.D., Constantine was sole ruler of the empire and Christianity had become his favorite religion. And if you know anything about Constantine, you know what the next church is, Pergamus, about the tactic that that Satan turned to because he realized, again, persecution was not going to work. And just for a quick preview, he just basically merged Christianity and paganism together. And that worked. (laughs) Trust me. So, this is how I wanted to end in this part, in this church. Um, I think Beverly shows, you know, that, that lineage, the lineage videos. This is what they had to say about Smyrna. And that's why I want to end it here. Ephesus acted as a natural gateway to the province of Asia, the beginning of the imperial postal highway that wound its way towards Smyrna before trailing further upwards to Pergamos. This name Smyrna means sweet smelling and is synonymous with myrrh. In order for the perfume to be extracted from myrrh, the bark must be crushed and bruised. It is a fitting metaphor for the existence that the Church of Smyrna had. 
They faced bitter and trying persecution, but instead of destroying them, the bruising trial served to bring out the sweetness of Jesus' character in their midst. God often works in this way in the lives of his people. He allows bruising in order for beauty to take his place. Jesus begins his message to the church of Smyrna with the words, I know. I know what you're going through. I know your works and struggles in poverty. I know. Sometimes when we're struggling through circumstances that seem insurmountable, it's comforting to realize that God knows. He understands our struggles, our pain, our efforts. He knows with with knowledge comes something else, the fact that he cares. The message to the church of Smyrna is one of comfort and assurance. It is, a, it is Jesus speaking to his beloved as he is pressed down and walking through the fire and telling her to hang in there because he is walking through the fire with her. And that's a message that a lot of us need to hear right now because a lot of us are going through the fire right now. So remember, he knows what you're going through. Most historians believe that Polycarp was the leading bishop or minister of the Church of Smyrna. The message to Smyrna covers the period of time when the church went through tremendous persecution under the the successive Roman emperors. When Polycarp was forced to offer incense to the emperor as a sign of loyalty and fidelity, he refused. He was then sentenced to death and was burned at the stake on Mount Pegasus around 168 A.D. Polycarp's martyrdom was a small taste of the kind of persecution and suffering the church endured. The Sumerian period of church history extends from 100 A.D. to 350 A.D. It was during this time that the church suffered the most brutal persecution under the Roman emperors. Men like Marcus Aurelius, um, Vespasian, Diocletian, and Domitian were both sadistic and relentless in their pursuit of Christians. Many Christians were forced to meet in secret during this period of history. Many were burned at the stake or thrown to the wild beasts in the arenas across the empire. Jesus tells them in Revelations 2, chapter 10, that they would endure persecution 10 days. Sometimes it helps to know that there is an end in sight to whatever awful thing we have been called to endure. In the case of Smyrna, the church during this period went through 10 persecutions under pagan Roman. Uh, pagan Roman. It was an era of pain and bitterness, and it was also an era of both spiritual purity and power. To persecute it, the church kept her garments pure and spotless. She was pressed down to the grinding will of the oppressor, but she did not allow her face to be broken. Through the cr- though crushed, she emanated the sweet fragrance of Jesus' love for the Father and his truth. Of all the periods of persecution, the worst of all took place over a period of 10 years under the Emperor Diocletian. This lasted from 303 A.D. to 313 A.D. until Constantine took the imperial throne. Unlike the other churches, Smyrna is not given any reproof. She didn't need any. She was neither complacent nor deficient. Her spiritual experience was rich. Her love for Jesus steadfast and sure. The church that suffered the greatest persecution is also the church that was the purest. Jesus tells Smyrna to hang in there, to not lose faith or hope. Be thou faithful unto death. He urges them, and I will give you a crown of life. Be faithful. Be faithful even when faithfulness is the last thing on your mind. Be faithful when it hurts. Be faithful when it's dark and there seems to be no light. Be faithful unto death. It is easy to be faithful to God when everything is going our way. To trust him in the light. But none of this was true for Smyrna. Nothing was going their way and darkness shrouded them like an oppressive cloud. It was at that moment when being faithful was hard that Jesus told them, I know what you're going through, but hang in there. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. When the Christians of this era were taken to the arenas to die, they were dressed in rags, endured appalling prison conditions, and were generally looked, on, looked upon as the scum of the earth. It was not cool to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. But Jesus assured them, for all the shame and humiliation they endured, if they were faithful, there would be a crown awaiting them on the other side of it all. More often than, often than not in the world we live in, it's not cool to be a Christian. You can be laughed at, ridiculed, or crucified on social media for who you are and what you believe. But here's the thing. Jesus says, I get it. I know what you're going through, but hang in there. Be faithful even unto death. I have a crown with your name on it waiting on the other side. So the message is to be faithful, you know, 
that time is coming back. We are in these last few hours, few minutes, few seconds of time's history. And if we need to get ourselves prepared, we need nothing to do but go back and look at the church of Smyrna for inspiration, for encouragement. It says that that was the worst persecution in the church history. And when you look upon it, they went through something really terrible, and it was 10 years long. So we're going to have to get bold, and we're going to have to commit fully to the Lord and be willing to suffer for him if we're called upon to do that. That is the only way. That is how we get we gain our purity as Christians. That is why people go through struggles and tribulations. It's usually to bring you back because you're straying away. If you're going through tribulations, a lot of times uh, it's because you've, you're, maybe you haven't completely forgotten, but it's, you're not depending upon God the way you should. And I can just think about some of the things I've gone through and my family have gone through. And it is amazing how close you get back to the Lord when you're going through that fire because he is the only strength. That you have to lean on. So for, I, there's a lot of us going through a lot of things right now. So I just encourage everyone like, to read what Jesus' words. He understands. He knows what we're going through. And he's there. So be faithful. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, there's a lot going on right now. There's a lot of suffering that's going on right now. There's a lot of people that's going through loss in their families. There's wars. There's famine. There's pestilence. There's people who have lost their love for one another, Lord. And all of us are going through our own struggles, our own tribulations, Lord. But, Lord, you, we just want to thank you for being there, for always being available to us and allowing you to be our strength, to be our pillar, to be our rock. And we know what time, that we're in the end of time. And we know that the, the last um, days are here and we're about to go through another time of trouble. And so, Lord, we ask that you embolden everyone that's listening to all the people who serve you to embolden and strengthen them and to give them the courage to stand strong, to stand true and to not give in no matter the cost, no matter the penalty, no matter the suffering that's involved. And, Lord, we just ask for that purity um, as to bring it back to us so that we can be your priests and priestesses to represent you to the world, Lord. And we just want to ask that you bless us with that and to carry us forward as we go into these final conflicts. Lord, we thank you once again and that we love you and we trust you no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen.